Well, let me again begin my thanks to Daniel and the uh, uh, Forum for Democracy and Human Rights and to the university for allowing us to, uh, to be here and making this uh, an open space for uh, discussion and debate. Uh, I, I'm sure that it will be a, a, a lively one. I can see from how packed the room is that there is huge interest in this subject, which uh, rarely gets an open uh, discussion these days. My strategy for the evening is, is to zip through some um, prepared uh, notes and the prepared um, talk as quickly as possible, because I uh, am looking forward to questions and answers, and I hope that I don't uh, overextend my uh, welcome here with my, uh, so it's supposed to be half an hour and not much more. So let me uh, begin by saying that on the 31st of October 2010, a dozen or so well-organized, heavily armed jihadi shouting, shouting Allahu Akbar burst into Baghdad's feebly guarded Our Lady of Deliverance Syriac Catholic Church. The ensuing four-hour reign of terror left over 50 dead and over 70 wounded some of the survivors missing eyes and limbs. Meanwhile, the pro-Al-Qaeda Islamic State of Iraq claimed responsibility for the assault on this dirty den of idolaters, as they uh, called the church, and pledged that the killing sword of Islam will not be lifted from the necks of Iraq's Christians until their demands had been met. Now, the killing of uh, the Iraqi Christian hostages was made for the media. The masterminds of the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Islamic State of Iraq chose a prominent metropolitan church uh, to which the international media could gain easy access and coordinated effectively messages to the press during the prolonged uh, uh, siege. Uh, CNN, Al Jazeera, and the BBC were broadcasting breaking news throughout. On the following day, the global press churned out articles with headlines underscoring the existential crisis facing the Christians of Iraq, such as Iraq's Christians vow to survive and from Time magazine, or Iraq's war on Christians from the Los Angeles Times or Christians in Iraq living in fear of program from The Guardian in London. The US government responded, but its statements were in a much lower key. The first US government reaction came from the US Army spokesman in Iraq, ignoring the obvious sectarian dimensions to the mass murder in the name of Islam, he characterized the bloody deed in Benghazi-like fashion as a robbery gone wrong, noting that they, meaning Al-Qaeda, are resorting to petty crimes to try to finance themselves. Neither US President Barack Obama nor Secretary of State Hillary Clinton chose to comment. However, White House Press Secretary Robin Gibbs served the media a bland statement. Gibbs condemned this senseless act of hostage taking and violence, but without identifying its religious character or the seam of the crime uh, and the religious identity of the victims. It was left to Iraq's Christian Minister for Human Rights, Wijan Mikhail, to bring some sense of reality to the public about the massacre. Ms. Mikhail's perspective on the slaughter was different from Washington's. In her assessment, the evil deed was not senseless, as stated by the White House spokesman, but had been undertaken with a view to pushing the Christians out of Iraq. Two months later, another headline-grabbing terrorist attack against Christians took place, this time in the Mediterranean city of Alexandria. Over 1,000 worshipers were leaving the Coptic Orthodox Church of St. Mark just after midnight on New Year's Day, when a mighty explosion propelled nails, uh, ball bearings, and other pieces of shrapnel through the crowd killing 23 Christians and wounding nearly 100. This time, no terrorist group uh, claimed responsibility, but as usual, the f uh, many of the fingers were pointing in the direction of Al-Qaeda. The widely publicized mass murder of Christians in Baghdad and Alexandria elicited customary ritual condolences and politically cautious condemnations from statesmen around the world. 
after facing some criticism for failing to issue a statement in his own name following the Baghdad massacre, President Obama condemned in a written statement the Alexandria bombing stating that the perpetrators of this attack were clearly, clearly targeting Christian worshipers and that they had no respect for human life and dignity. But there were several more thoughtful, stronger, and in fact surprising responses again from non-American statesmen. What is happening to Christians in the Middle East is genocide, declared Lebanon's former uh, president Amin Jamal to the International in Beirut. Within days, French President Nicolas Sarkozy e echoed Jamal's assessment, stating, we cannot accept and thereby facilitate what looks more and more like a, by a particularly perverse program of cleansing in the Middle East, that is, religious cleansing. The French president then asked his prime minister to commission a former senator to produce a report on the situation of Christians uh, in the Middle East, and in doing so, the French prime minister noted, the Christians of the Middle East confront grave difficulties which provoke mass immigration from their countries in recent years. He went on to identify not only terrorism, but also mounting communal tensions as obvious causes. One can quibble about the strong terms used by Jamal and Sarkozy, but the undeniable fact is that the Middle East is being emptied of its Christian, Christians and other non-Muslim communities. While Europe and the rest of the Western world becomes more pluralistic and multicultural, the Middle East is rapidly losing its religious, di uh, religious diversity and is becoming more homogenous. The most obvious sign of this to the man on the street can be seen in houses of worship in the West and in the Middle East. Throughout the West, mosques are rapidly multiplying and the Muslim population is increasing. While throughout much of the Middle East, there is a notable increase in the bombing, banning, and desecration of churches, as well as a rise in other anti-Christian acts of violence. But before continuing this negative line of thought, I should mention that I can think of at least two states in the region that seem to be bucking this disturbing trend. In Israel, as opposed to the occupied territories, the Christian population increases as a result of growing Arab birth rates and the immigration of Christians from Russia and other parts of the world. They're often spouses of Jews. In Qatar, the uh, Christian population grows mainly as a result of workers from around the world coming to participate in this emirate's economic boom. Moreover, the current emir has allowed the construction of churches to meet their spiritual needs. But Israel and Qatar are peculiar exceptions uh, to the rule. Back in 2001, Daniel Pipes forecast in the Middle East Quarterly in an article entitled, Disappearing Christians in the Middle East. At the present rate, he said, the Middle East 12 million Christians will likely drop to 6 million in the year tw uh, 2020. With time, Christians will effectively disappear from the region as a cultural and political force. While reliable demographic data from the region is difficult to come by, Pipe's assessment points to a troubling trend that is difficult to dismiss on the basis of empirical evidence. The peaks of the mass emigration of Christians, Jews, and other religious minorities over the past hundred years have coincided mainly with great upsurges of violence, such as the Armenian and Syrian genocides <coughs> in Turkey, the Assyrian massacres in Iraq, the Arab-Israeli conflicts, uh, civil war in Lebanon, the reign of terror in Mesopotamia in the aftermath of Operation Freedom Iraq, and now the regional turmoil ignited by the so-called Arab Spring uprisings. And of course, many of you will have seen the uh, headline in today's NZZ about one million Syrians being displaced, and of course, many of them uh, will be members of the country's religious minorities. It must also be noted that on the territory of present-day Saudi Arabia, non-Muslims have been banned from engaging in public worship, bearing religious symbols, and openly participating in religious communal life since the early decades of the Islamic State. 
before addressing the forces driving Christians and other religious minorities out of the Middle East, let's take a quick look at the region and its religious and the religious minorities that inhabit it. At the time of the Islamic conquest of the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century, most of the then Byzantine ruled Middle East was predominantly Christian. By the eve of the First World War, between 20 and 25 percent of the population of Muslim-ruled Middle East was non-Muslim. The overwhelming majority of this non-Muslim uh, minority were then Christians. Today, the non-Muslim population of the region, say excluding Israel, is probably well under 5 percent. The region's uh, Christians are divided into many different historic confessions and rites. There are various Catholics, Orthodox, Copts, Assyrians, etc. Too many to, uh, to name them all. But since the 19th century, there have also uh, been some small Protestant evangelical communities that have established uh, roots in the region through Western uh, missionary activity. The region also hosts relatively small ancient sects like the Druze and the Alawites of the Levant and the Yazidis and Mandeans of, the Mesopotam of Mesopotamia. The Mandeans are particularly interesting to me because they claim, and I believe they do, have direct continuity with the followers of John the Baptist. and They somehow survived uh, many persecutions after all of these years, although they're now virtually extinct in Iraq. There are far more in Germany than, than there are in Iraq. In our times, the Baha'i faith has made inroads in the upper uh, levels of educated Egyptian society. Jews too must figure in any talk about religious minorities in the Middle East. While Jews are the, obviously the majority in the state of Israel today, they have for thousands of years been a significant minority in the broader region. While numerically the Jews of the Middle East uh, in Ottoman times con uh, constitute a just a small minority, the Jewish community played an, uh, often an important role in the commerce and intellectual uh, life of the region. Jews were particularly well established in Iraq where they had a continuous home since the time of the Babylonian captivity in the sixth century BC, surviving not without tribulations, centuries of Islamic rule. Today, Iraq's ancient Jewish community numbers fewer than 10 people. The Iraqi Jewish community perished in what we tend to think of as the progressive second half of the 20th century. It happened against the backdrop of a clash between two apparently incompatible nationalist ideologies, Arabism and Zionism, each possessing a strong religious backbone that does not provide great scope for compromise. The ancient Jewish communities of Cairo, Alexandria, and Damascus now look very much like Jewish free or virtually Jewish free Baghdad. And speaking about uh, Iraq and the Jewish community there, uh, I'd like to share a little story that um, uh, is an experience that I had in the Iraqi village of El Kosh, which is just outside Mosul, the ancient city of Nineveh. The prophet Nahum, reputedly according to the Bible, came from El Kosh. And it's a, a village that uh, at least used to be populated by Christians and Jews. And I met a Christian victim of terror. Uh, she was born, she's an elderly lady now. Her, um, <coughs> Uh, she married a, uh, a Christian from Mosul, the town of Mosul, went off to Mosul as a young married woman. Her husband was killed in an act of terror after the fall of uh, Saddam Hussein. She moved back for security to her home village of Al Kosh, and I had a chance to interview. I was interviewing mainly because her husband had been killed uh, in this act of terror. And she told me that she remembered the expulsion of the Jews from her village. She was a girl at the time and really didn't quite understand what was going on, but her family went to buy furniture from uh, the home of a departing Jewish family. They were selling all of their you know, uh, furniture and things that they couldn't take, take with them. And uh, there was a Christian lady who was also there mocking the Jewish family making fun of them for their uh, miserable situation. And the Jewish lady of the house uh, turned to this mocking lady and looked at her, wagged her finger and said, 
remember Sunday follows Saturday. What's happening to us will happen to you. This young girl at the time didn't get what was going on. There was just upheaval and confusion. She gets it now uh, as, an elderly, as an elderly lady. Um, and in fact, in El Kosh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, synagogue. It used to be a shrine, a place of pilgrimage, and it's just a tumbled down, uh, tumbled down ruin. There are no, no more Jews in um, El Kosh. So Sunday follows uh, Saturday. The fate of the uh, Sunday people follows the fate of the Saturday people, according to this um, the statement that was made by perhaps El Kosh's second prophet, this anonymous Jewish lady. And it's now the turn of the Sunday people throughout uh, much of the Middle East. The pace of displacement and exodus has definitely not slackened in the aftermath of the Arab Spring uprisings. Radical Sharia-based Sunni Islamism has emerged, has emerged as a dominant political force. The slogan of the ascendant Islamists is, Sharia is the answer. Washington, its European and Middle Eastern uh, allies, appear to back this dangerous political experiment. It's my hunch that Washington believes it can corrupt uh, the region's new Islamist political stars as it has had customarily done uh, with the burnt out stars of yesteryear. But that's just a suspicion. In Syria, amidst the cacophony of civil war, one hears a genocidal slogan death to Alawites and Christians to Beirut. The reports that come to me both via the media and from people in and near Syria confirm that Christians and other religious minorities are being targeted by Islamist rebels. They're also, of course, just victims of the general upheaval and uh, confusion and bloodshed in the country. And Syria looks set to become a worse disaster zone than post Saddam Hussein Iraq which saw over half of the Iraqi Christians forced to leave their homes. Ironically, many of them sought and received refuge in Bashar Assad's Syria, where they're stuck today, wondering what to do to, uh, uh, to secure their futures. In Egypt, incitement to acts of violence and acts of, uh, to, to violence and actually acts of violence against Christians are increasing. At a lecture in Zurich last November, Maurice Tadros, an Egyptian scholar and the author of an excellent new book on the contemporary Muslim Brotherhood, report, reported alarming cases of religious cleansing in some remote uh, Egyptian villages. She also warned of the development of an authoritarian, majoritarian system in Egypt that institutionalizes discrimination against religious minorities and women. In Egypt, we witness today scenes that are eerily reminiscent of anti-Jewish discrimination and violence in late 19th century uh, Russia and Poland, and in Central Europe during the 1920s and 30s as fascism gained its upper hand. While the blunt words of Presidents Sarkozy and Jamal may benefit from some fine tuning and qualification, we can see at the present time dangerous conditions for genocide and religious cleansing unfolding. Those who issued uh, such pro uh, prophetic genocide warnings in the 1920s and 30s in response to the rise of fascism were largely marginalized in the Western world, and so is the case today. How, it can, how can it be that religious minorities are being driven out of the Middle East in our progressive post-enlightenment age, when never again is uttered repeatedly by American presidents and other Western leaders, and in an era when minorities of all sorts, religious and otherwise, are better protected under international law than at any other time in human history. Today, there are a host of international treaties, covenants, and declarations that exist to guarantee the rights of vulnerable minorities. Among them are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Genocide Convention, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National, Ethnic, Religious, or Linguistic Minorities. 
under the auspices of the UN and other international bodies, extensive networks of institutions and vast bureaucracies have been established to foster respect for minority rights. If we take a glance at the historical process that led to the protection of minority rights under international law, we can see something of the dynamics that produced the mass, mass exodus of religious minorities from the better part of the Middle East in modern times. The process of multilateral international accords for the protection of religious minorities began in Christian Europe with sovereign states signing the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 as the modern European state system took shape. As this process developed, it was secularized by the ascendant forces of the Enlightenment. What was once understood to be Christendom transformed itself into the secularized Western world based on Enlightenment values, drawn mainly from the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition of old Christendom. During the 20th century, Western Enlightenment-based human rights law assumed a supreme universal character through the stamp imposed by the United Nations system, then dominated by the United States and the European powers. Now, Christendom first penetrated the Islamic-ruled uh, Middle East during the Crusades, but secular Enlightenment-based law and custom began to penetrate the Muslim-dominated uh, Muslim Middle East in the 19th century. And this penetration was made possible by a dramatic geopolitical shift in the balance of uh, global power. The Islamic Ottoman uh, Empire, which encompassed at least not nominally the entire Middle East, was then rapidly declining in power. Meanwhile, the Western states were growing in power. The European imperial powers, especially Britain, France, and the Habsburg Empire, feared a collapse of the Ottoman Empire. A collapse had the potential to provoke uh, violence and uncontrollable uh, collisions between those very powers themselves in a scramble to protect vital strategic and economic interests. Their recipe for patching up the sinking Ottoman ship was to apply Western-style reform. The goal of the Western powers was then to keep the Ottoman Empire as, as intact as possible and to reform it so that it could join the Westphalian uh, European state system and play a construct and constructive role in, uh, as a full member of the Concert of Europe. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War, the direct influence of Britain and France uh, increased as a result of their temporary League of, Ma League of Nations mandates to govern Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine. This meant that Enlightenment values penetrated still further. But in the Middle East, the universal Enlightenment values confronted another strong set of universal values in the shape of Islamic Sharia law. While the Enlightenment values, as reflected in internationally accepted human rights uh, instruments, tend towards equality, Sharia values enshrined, enshrine Muslim supremacism, and the subordinate position of non-Muslims as kufar, that is to say as infidels, in the divine order of the universe. The two are not compatible. According to the traditional Sharia system, non-Muslim infidels, be they individuals or entire communities, merit protection. That is to say, they deserve to be granted so-called dhimmi status from the supreme Islamic authority on condition that their behavior in no way threatens or challenges that authority. Those individuals or communities who do not enhance the power of the Islamic system are outside the law and without protection. The late Professor Kenneth Craig, long a champion of Christian-Muslim dialogue, described the limits of toleration provided by Sharia as follows. Dimi, or tolerated minority status under Islam, he says, has long made for a pattern of acquiescence in ancient local Christianity around the mosque. <coughs> the traditional tolerance allowed only a freedom to remain, to teach the faith only within the family, so that adherence became a circumstance of birth and continuity, that of a closed community. There was no freedom to express faith, still less to recruit it, 
outside that circle of one's uh, own origins. Thus we can see with the Sharia's prohibition on evangelization or the spread of any other non-Muslim faith amongst Muslims and its draconian death penalty for conversion away from Islam and blasphemy laws, etc., religious minorities are ultimately doomed to wither away and die even in the absence of direct violent persecution. This religious supremacism is a key element of the radical Islamist ideology that is in ascendance in the corridors of power in the Middle East today. It remains to be seen whether the region's Islamist powers are capable and willing to do more than make tactical concessions in the face of, stiff, uh, of still superior Western power, or whether radical Islamism without fundamental compromises of principle will prevail as was the case, say, with fascism in Europe uh, until stopped by superior power in the mid-1920, in the mid in the mid-20th century. It would be a mistake to take home the impression that what I refer to simply as enlightenment values for shorthand purposes have made no significant inroads in the Muslim-dominated Middle East. Over the past two centuries, the old Sharia system has suffered serious erosion. We all know personally and, through, and, and also through the media of Muslims from the region who are essentially people who hold dear enlightenment values and are prepared to make great sacrifices in defense of them. We see some noble uh, initiatives in the region. For example, one that I recently came across is that of uh, Turan Kayalugo of the Brookings Center um, in Doha who urged the Organization of Islamic Conference to revise the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam, which as it currently stands, makes all human rights dependent on discriminatory Sharia principles. He and others would like to see it stand in harmony with the universal human rights instruments as accepted by the United Nations. But despite such initiatives, Enlightenment values have not triumphed over Sharia values neither in the Middle East nor even here in the West, where we hear increasingly calls for the introduction of Sharia norms here and there. The supremacy of Islam and its adherence vis-a-vis -vis peoples of other religions and worldviews remains a surviving core value in Muslim society. It is part of what we might call the customary law of the Muslim-dominated Middle East, even if it is not enshrined in modern statute law. For the past two centuries, religious minorities of the regions have had to make the hard choice between aligning themselves with the local Islamic uh, powers for protection or for opting for the enlightenment values offered by the advanced and mighty Western powers. Many Christian int intellectuals in the 20th century, especially in following the departure of the European uh, powers, believe the chances of survival would be enhanced of, uh, by embracing Arab nationalism as an offshoot of uh, secular en enlightenment. But such a strategy has produced meager results so far. The collision of two conflicting sets of universal values has created an even more dangerous situation for religious minorities than was the case when they were forced to submit to traditional Sharia uh, without any challenge from the West. Opting for enlightenment values has been a hazardous undertaking from the beginning. When Napoleon invaded Ottoman Egypt in 1798, his way of winning the hearts and minds of his new Muslim subjects was to project himself as a Muslim ruler, a protector of Islamic values, and to order his soldiers and administrators to treat Muslims and their institutions with respect. But Napoleon was neither a genuine convert to an Islam, nor did he establish a system of government based on sacrosanct Sharia principles. Instead, he introduced values of the secular European Enlightenment. He promised Egypt's Copt Coptic minority freedom from discrimination. Some prominent Copts aligned themselves with the French promoter of Enlightenment values. Napoleon offered a very attractive deal to the uh, uh, oppressed Coptic minority of Egypt, declaring 
I will always be delighted to protect the Coptic community. From now on, it shall not be degraded. And when circumstances permit, I will grant it the right to practice its religion publicly, as is customary in Europe, where each follows his belief freely. I will severely punish the villages that murdered Copts uh, during the various rebellions. As from today, I permit the Copts to carry weapons, mount mules or horses, wear turbans, and dress in whatever way they like. These were all prohibitions against uh, the uh, Christian minorities at that time. Now, Muslim uh, opinion in Egypt was then scandalized. As Professor Rogan, um, in his recent book, The Arabs Observed, the Enlightenment values that the French held to be universal were deeply offensive to many, uh, many Egyptians, both as Ottoman subjects and as observant Muslims. And only three years after invading, Napoleon's adventure in Egypt came to an end. The French withdrew, the Ottomans regained power, and there was hell to pay for the Egyptians who, uh, who aligned themselves with the infidel invader and his Enlightenment values. The hell included massacres against Christians. There is just one more example of this dilemma that I would like to highlight tonight. Assyrian Christians were among the victims uh, of what is most often to, referred to these days as the Armenian Genocide in Turkey during the First World War. Survivors fled to what is today northern Iraq, where Assyrian communities were well established. After the First World War, Iraq became a British mandate and the Assyrians uh, enjoyed British protection and the Enlightenment values that they brought uh, with them. Assyrian soldiers served the interests of their European protectors. As Britain prepared to grant independence to Iraq in 1983, Assyrian leadership was alarmed about its security under Muslim rule and petitioned the British authorities for a, a guarantee for their minority rights. The response from London was as follows. The British government is satisfied that upon the uh, establishment of Iraq as an independent state and as a member of the League of Nations, there will be no need for any special discrimination in favor of racial and religious minorities. The British Inspector General in Mosul was more blunt in his advice. If the Assyrians were not satisfied to live in Iraq without the protection of minority rights, uh, he said, they should leave the country. The Assyrians were soon to learn the true value of their cooperation with the Europeans of the Enlightenment tradition. In August 1933, over 1,000 Assyrians were massacred by soldiers belonging to the new uh, Iraqi National Army, together with allied uh, Kurdish militiamen. The suspicion that the inclination of uh, Christians and Jews would try to free themselves from Islamic rule by conspiring with non-Muslim powers has a history that goes back to the time of the establishment of the first Islamic state and the rule of the rightly guided caliphs. And this suspicion remains, remains strong in Iraq in 1933, and I suspect it is still strong today. According to the late uh, Ali Khadouri, a native of, uh, of Iraq, the perpetrators felt that by raping Assyrian women and killing Assyrian men, they were inflicting defeat on the British, whose clients and auxiliaries they considered the Assyrians to be. And the British government offered no public protest following the massacre. We can say, see the same murderous dynamic uh, at work in an anti-infidel prayer composed by the late Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, which now rules Egypt. Referring not only to the British infidel occupiers of his day, but also to those who have aided them, or have made peace with them, or have befriended them, Albana implores the Almighty to annihilate them and to let calamities descend on them. The plight of religious minorities remains a dismal and low le no less precarious uh, uh, situation today than at the time of Napoleon's withdrawal from Egypt or during the uh, first, uh, at first the British uh, and later the American withdrawals from Iraq. 
For the religious minorities, it can be said with justice, in many cases, the Enlightenment medicine, when applied in such a lackluster way, has proven to be worse than the disease it was meant to cure. We must fear for the worst, with or without Al-Qaeda, when the powerful neo-imperial states of the West encourage Arab Spring uprisings against dictators in the name of democracy and human rights, only to leave religious minorities and other vulnerable people in the lurch. There are no good grounds for believing that the United States and its Western allies have any interest in advancing substantial and in a, in a sustained way uh, to see through an irreversible triumph of the universal norms of uh, human rights that arise from the Enlightenment tradition. There certainly is no uh, public opinion pressure for that, and it's uh, not within the realm, realm of imagination. Western policymakers do not want to follow the footsteps of some of their imperialist forefathers by assuming responsibility for uh, security and good governance in less developed parts of the world when strategic interests and vital markets can be protected and valuable resources obtained without incurring uh, the price, and it can be a very substantial price, of political responsibility. We will soon see whether the United States and its Western uh, partners persist in half-heartedly promoting Enlightenment values in the Middle East, or whether they abandon them altogether as too costly to tinker with and opt for closer accommodation with radical Sharia-based uh, Islam at the expense of the region's religious minorities. There are signs that the latter is becoming increasingly possible. But neither option means good news for the hard-pressed religious minorities of the Middle East. And on that less than cheerful note, I will conclude my prepared remarks and look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much.